This is Gene Adam, former lead singer of Iced Earth. Be sure to subscribe to Podcast in Stone. And don't forget, join our community on social media. Metal lives. This is Brent Smedley, otherwise known as Deadly Smedley, drummer for Iced Earth, and you're watching Podcast in Stone. Ladies and gentlemen of the Iced Earth community, welcome to Podcast in Stone, the only podcast 100% dedicated to Iced motherfucking Earth. We were on our quest for the five Infinity Stones, or the Ice Stones in this case. The Lead Stone, the Master Stone, the Base Stone, the Voice Stone. Today, we complete our hunt with the Fifth Stone, the Final Stone, the Drum Motherfucking Stone. We have Brent Smedley on the show. I'm also joined by Chuck Hoskins, by the way. I had to throw that in there. Brent, how you doing, my friend? Doing well, man. Doing well. How are you? I am ecstatic right now. <laughs> this is fun. It's good. Chuck, Good times. Thanks for, I'm great. Thanks for spending time with us today, Brent. It's a real, real treat. Oh, my, my pleasure, man. Thanks for all you guys do, man. We love you guys. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll kick this off uh, the, in the usual fashion. Um, can you tell us about your the inspirations and influences of what made you pick up the sticks and go mm -hmm. at it? Okay. Uh, at drums. Sure. Uh, I mean, when I was younger, I actually started on piano, you know, just briefly. And uh, piano just wasn't really my thing. I quickly gravitate, <clears throat> gravitated to drums and stuff. Um, the first music that I was really getting into would be like Jimi Hendrix and Black Sabbath, you know, like Purple Haze and like the old Black Sabbath, you know, all the classics. Um, those were definitely the first influences. And from there, then the big one was Iron Maiden. I mean, they're definitely the kings in my book. Those guys, for sure, uh, as well as bands like, uh, you know, Queensryche uh, and then Pantera in the later years and whatnot. So, yeah, pretty much those. You know, and, of course, the classics, you know, Judas Priest and whatnot. Nice. Uh, can you tell us about the first band that you were in? The first band that I was in. Let's see. Well... There was a couple early on that we didn't really do a whole lot that amounted to much, but the first real band that I was in was with my brother and a group of other guys. I think by the end, we had maybe one song of our own, but we would just kind of get together and jam. We actually called it Boxy. Uh, nobody really knows about that because we didn't do anything. We didn't play any shows. We didn't make any recordings or anything. But uh, after that, then me and my brother... I uh, had a band that we called Delta 9 with a few other guys. We actually had a keyboard player and whatnot. We just did a bunch of cover tunes, all kinds of stuff, everything from like Black Sabbath to uh, we even did some stuff like Jethro Tull. We did some Genesis. I mean, we did some really uh, different stuff because we had a keyboard player. Um, but then after that, the first real band that I was in, that did like originals and metal music and whatnot was a band I was in with some high school buddies of mine. We called it Noble Savage. And we actually made our, we made a demo, a four song cassette back in, I guess it would have been 1987. We played quite a few shows and whatnot. We even uh, began to search for a record deal, you know, and carry on like that. So that would be the first real band that, you know, like had our own songs, made a recording and played concerts and whatnot. Noble Savage. Okay, nice. Um, there's, there was a band that I thought you was in, but I could be mistaken, so don't hate me for this. Uh, was, you, was you in a band called Tempest Reigns? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I got most that definitely. Right. Awesome. I got that right. I, I had it in the back of my head, like, huh. I'm sure he was in that band. He was in Oracle, which Chuck uh, just helped me discover yesterday, which is awesome. Oh, so, yeah. That so. one was with my brother. That one, we did a lot of stuff with that. We actually started off with the name Prodigy. We played in town and in our home state uh, literally a thousand times. I mean, we played a lot of shows. We did a lot of really cool stuff. Back in the day when it wasn't so common to be able to open up for national acts, we opened up for, say, Megadeth on the Rust in Peace tour, and it was just us and Megadeth. It wasn't like 10 other bands. It was just us and them. We opened up for, like, Pantera, Cowboys from Hell tour, Wow. Uh, 
a couple other really cool bands like uh, Lizzie Borden, Doro Pesh, Nitro, Vicious Rumors. I mean, a ton of bands. That's the first band that we went on to, uh, you know, get a record deal and release a full blown album. But as it came out, we had to change the name from Prodigy. We changed it to Oracle because of the band The Prodigy. You know, the rave band, the Firestarter guys and whatnot. So anyhow, hence the name change. But yeah, we did a lot of really cool stuff with that band. Yeah, I was, uh, I was very, uh, I was very happy to um to share to share that on the on the group because um I never knew about that band until Chuck showed me. And I mm-hmm. listened to the listened to the album. I was really actually really impressed with it. So oh, thanks, I thought, man. Yeah. I thought it was really cool to share that with everyone. Um, yeah, thanks a yeah, lot. I'm, I'm on the hunt for the CD. You can find them on eBay, but they're kind of pricey. They go from like forty to sixty. Really? Yeah, they're not cheap. So I'll yeah, shop around and get deal, one. That deal ended. Uh, we signed with them in '93, and I think it expired in like '98. And, uh, okay. yeah. So can you, can you tell us about the events that led you to, uh, to the iced earth camp and your involvement in the days of purgatory? Okay. Yeah, sure. It's actually kind of a really interesting story. My first, uh, first time I ever talked to John, there's a fellow that I, I know just, uh, over the phone. I've never met him. His name's Steve Woodham he lives in Alabama. And he's a guy that knows, he knows a lot of guys in bands. I mean, he's given me home phone numbers for guys in like name bands, you know, and I've, I've called them and it's been them for sure. You know, just get an answering machine. But, uh, it's one of them things where it's like, Hey, I'll give you this number, but you didn't get it from me. So anyway, um, that guy, I think it was the only time that he ever talked to John. He just got a hold of John one time and he was like, Hey, you know, I really like you guys. What's going on with you? Is there anything that I can do to help you guys? And it was uh, between burnt offerings. It was right before Dark Saga. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> let's see. I, I uh, had seen an ad in like a metal magazine for the new Nevermore album. And I was a Sanctuary fan from back in the day. And it was something about send in for a catalog for Century Media. So I sent off for it. And it came, and then the next day, it came with a little sampler CD. It had like maybe 20 bands on. It had one song from each band, and the song Burnt Offerings was on there. It was like the second track. And I liked the intro so much that uh, I put it on my answering machine. Back in the, I'm sort of dating myself, and I'm an older guy, but back in the days, the answering machines, <laughs> I put that intro right. on, and I did my little cool thing about, hey, this is Brent, you know, I can't get to the phone, and the song's playing in the background. Well, anyhow... John got a hold of my number, like I said, from Steve, and he called my house. Now, I've never talked to John, don't know who the Ice Earth guys. I've heard of them, for sure, but uh, I'll never forget the message. Because he's like, hey, you know, Brent, this is John from Ice Earth. I got your number from Steve, and, uh, you know, we're looking for a drummer. And then he pauses, and he's like, whoa, dude, I know that song. He starts freaking out, because I got their song on my answering machine. So anyhow, that was sort of a freaky thing. Anyhow, I called him and I talked to him. He told me what was going on and whatnot. And he's like, you know, we're auditioning. Like, I think they tried out a dozen drummers. And he said, you know, we want you to learn these two songs. I did, uh, what was it, last December? And then Dante's Inferno, which, you know, as you know, that's like four songs in one. That's a lot of notes. <clears throat> so I went down. They were based out of Tampa then, you know, and I'm in Jacksonville, so it's only a few hours. I went down and tried out, met the guys. It went well. Uh, you know, it was, it was neat to meet all the guys. And uh, afterwards, I think we went to, uh, I don't know, it might have been Denny's or something like that. And we were just talking and whatnot. John's like, well, we got one other guy coming out, you know, so we'll let you know. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, I really didn't expect to get it. I think they had the guy from Atheist. I'm not sure who that is, the drummer's name, but he was the last guy coming. And about two days later, I got a call from John. He's like, hey, man, the gig's yours, you know, you want to do it. And, you know, as they say, I guess the rest is history. But I always thought that phone call and the last December and all that, that was really eerie. You know, it was like destiny, I guess you'd say, maybe. Now, uh, so, uh, so that's that about, about the, the coming into the band. The Days of Purgatory, that, uh, that was an interesting thing, because in the beginning... 
it was just going to be like a sort of an in-between record, you know, in, instead of like a live record before the next studio release, it was going to be, you know, a reissue of some of the older songs done with Matt and whatnot. It was only supposed to be initially like maybe one CD worth of songs. And then it grew into the monster, you know, the three CDs and all the songs and whatnot. But what we did was we, we took four tunes and we redid the drums and the bass to them. And I think uh, the songs were Nightmares, Winter Nights, Iced Earth, Colors. I think there was one more that we were going to do, but the Cast old recording. Star, maybe? I think it was Curse the Sky, maybe. Okay. I'm not sure, but it never got used because the old recording wasn't done to a click track. It actually weaved a little bit and whatnot, and it just... Uh, it didn't work like the other songs did. So we redid those, went into more sound, redid them. And uh, it was kind of, it was like a really different way of recording because usually the drums are done first. You know, that's the foundation. You build everything up from there. What we did was we went in and replaced the foundation to the old rhythm guitars. You know what I mean? And it, we changed some of it quite a bit. So it was neat to do it. It was like changing the pocket of certain things, you know, changing the groove and changing the feel. But I enjoyed it. It, it was quick on my end as far as, you know, just four tunes. But, uh, you know, they went on to do an awful lot of stuff with it. And then we did a really cool tour for the, you know, that record. And one thing that we did, uh, me and, you know, Jimmy McDonough was playing bass at the time. Me and him really loved the Burn Offerings album. And they only played a handful of shows for that record. And uh, we got John to do a bunch of tunes off that record that they had never played live. Or, I mean, not never, maybe, but had, it hadn't really gotten a proper tour and whatnot. We just loved right. the tunes. We did right. songs like Brainwash, Diary, uh, I mean, a lot of them. It was a lot of fun. I mean, it was a, it was a hell of a set. It was a lot, a lot of notes and a burner, but we had a lot of fun doing that. So that was really cool. And I mean, the art and everything, you know, that's probably yeah. my favorite yeah. album cover. I would have to say, of Ice Earth. Oh. It sums it up. Like we, me and Chuck have had that. Con we've we've had, but we've had the burnt offerings conversation with Stu, with Luke, and everyone. And it's just like that cover just sums up that record so well in its tone, and mm -hmm. what, what what you get from that record. You look at that cover and think, yes, this is exactly. I expect darkness. I expect raw. I expect evil, and that's what you get with that album. I love that album. Evil. Evil. Right. <laughs> okay, so after the tour, then the Something Wicked came up. Now, you wasn't on that album. What led you no. to not play on that? Because I, I know me and you had talked about this a couple days ago. A lot of Ice mm -hmm. Earth fans are kind of confused because you're like, you're here, here. Mm -hmm. You're here at this point, and then you're kind of gone. Then you're on the next tour. Then you're missing again. Can you kind of let us know the events that kind of happened there? Sure. Uh, well, part of it... <clears throat> Part of it was the timing of coming into the band. You know, as I came in, they had already worked up, <clears throat> they'd already worked up the Dark Saga record with a guy that played on it, Mark Prater. So they went ahead and recorded it with him. And then as I came in, I did the touring for that. And then uh, the timing of the releases, because Days of Purgatory was next instead of a studio album. You know, if a studio album would have been next, obviously I would have been on it. But then we did the Days of Purgatory, and it was some time. And then in the early days, to be honest with you, it was a lot of me and my personal demons. You know, I had things that I was dealing with. And uh, I guess one of the things for me is I get such a rush and such a high off of playing live. You know, there's nothing like that. But then coming off of stage afterwards, trying to calm down and trying to kind of sustain that feeling. You know, in the early days, I would, uh, how can I put this, engage in some somewhat self-destructive behavior you know, to try and attain that same feeling. So that messed me up for quite a bit. And, uh, you know, so I, I walked away for a while there before the Something Wicked record. And then I thought I was ready to come back. And I came back and I was fine for a while, but I wasn't quite ready. I hadn't really worked through uh, all of my issues, we'll say. So then that's why I left the time the second time then after they're alive in athens so that's a little yeah. bit of uh the background of that and then the last time that i left that was for a 
different, a uh, completely different thing. Leaving after the dystopia album, you know, I definitely did not want to. That was such a good time and a rising time for the band. You know, dystopia was, uh, you know, that was really, really amazing. Um, but that time was for my my grandparents. You know, my grandfather and and my grandmother. They were in their twilight years, and I wanted to be there a lot more. And I was, and they're both gone now. So, uh, you know, I never really expected to be able to come back again like this. So it's really an amazing thing. And I think that the incorruptible record and the, uh, the cycle that we're on now, the band is in a similar rising pattern as Dystopia, but in a lot of ways, even we're burning even brighter. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's amazing. I mean, we're really, really digging on it. The camaraderie in the band and, uh, you know, the, the playing ability and just the vibe. You know, it's, it's really, it's a golden time now for Iced Earth, I think. And we're really enjoying it. Uh, so that's a little, little bit. What's that? Sorry, I was just, I was just going to, uh, I've, I've been saying for the longest time that um, since Dystopia, it's, it's been somewhat of a renaissance for the band. Like it's been like the band's been on fire. There's this reinvigoration. There's just, uh, yeah, there's just so much. It's the band, the band's been on the roll since since then. And I, I oh, thanks, man. I would like to put that a lot of that onto Stu because I think Stu really brought that kind of energy back into oh, yeah. the band. You know, and I think that I know there's. Yeah, it's the first tour I saw you guys on, and it means a lot to me. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, Stu, Stu is our boy for sure, man. I call him part of the new breed, man. He's like the new breed. You know, he's just a, amazingly on fire every night. He brings the A game every night. And, uh, you know, Chuck, I know you saw it firsthand on, on the last tour, man. But the way he was digging my drum cage, man, I mean, he was all up on there, man. You know, in the second show in Cincinnati, he wasn't climbing yet, so I didn't see it till a couple shows later. So I don't uh -huh. know whether he didn't feel comfortable or it wasn't reinforced. I seen something where they said they reinforced part of it or something. So I, I didn't get to see yeah. the climbing. But it was still an awesome yeah. show. Yeah, I think he was a little hesitant at first, but with some uh, slight encouragement, I was like, "Oh, come on, dude, it'll be cool." You know, I got up there and crawled around a little, and I was like, "Man, it'll definitely support you." You know, just make sure you hang on. <laughs> you know, the singer falls into the drummer, and it could be a show ender. But hey, never happened. It yeah, held tough. That's rock and roll. That's rock and roll, man. That's rock and roll, man. Oh yeah. I do have a. No, I do you. Have... Go ahead. Go ahead, Sorry. Jason. Sorry, Chuck. I will just have a random drum question. Mm -hmm. so, okay, I saw I saw a new kit. I'm very jealous because it's awesome. Uh. I've noticed the the way you have your symbols. You have the arm kind of pointed down, and you have it mm -hmm. hanging. Yeah, I've never seen that before in my life. I usually have just really? a normal. Yeah, I've never seen that ever. Like, it's very, mm -hmm. very alien to me. Is that actually? Is it hey. actually? Is it a better way to have symbols? Uh, no. I mean, oh. technically, no. It should be supported from underneath so it resonates yeah. right. Okay. But I mean, live. You know, live, it, it doesn't make that much difference. It's a little harder for sure on the boom arms. I had a couple break, actually. Oh, okay. But it, it looks cool. It gives me a little small window between where the cymbals are and the drums are, so there's no stands. Yeah. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So you can yeah. see me. It's my little window. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it looked uh, kind of cool, too, you know? Yeah, It man. looks very cool. It's Thank got you. Good, got good aesthetic to it, man. <sighs> I was just going to say earlier, um, you had brought up uh, Alive in Athens, which I think is the greatest live album ever. Uh, and oh, other than John, you're the only one that's played on both that and Curion. Can you tell us what the mindset is going into a live show where you know it's being recorded as a, opposed to just a normal live set show? Okay, sure. Um, well, the Alive in Athens and the Ancient Curion, those two, where they were similar in some ways for sure, but in some ways they were very different. Alive in Athens, when we did that, we practiced for just those shows for 10 days for about 10 hours a day. 
on just those songs. And I mean, we were tight. And uh, then we went over, and I think, if I remember right, I think we played a show in Thessaloniki, and then we played two nights in Athens, which are the ones that were filmed and recorded. But for that, and we had been touring and playing all those songs for so long, most of them anyway, um, that we were just, you know, we were like on a fever pitch. We were so so tight and ready for that. But for me, and I did I did think about it, a little bit before Alive in Athens, and of course a lot, because I was, you know, it had been time before Alive in Curion. In a way, it's got to be your some of your best shows. You know, you definitely want it to be uh, the best show, and you want to give a show. You still want it to be a show. You know, want to you want to do your visual things, and you don't want to be just concentrating on playing the right notes. But you have to have that combination of playing everything correctly. You know, hopefully at the right tempos or close enough to them. And uh, also having a good show. So uh, it's that thing. But I do remember we were just so well rehearsed, you know, really for both of them. But John said something. I mean, he said many things over the years to me that have always stuck with me. And uh, the thing I always go to on that is he said, Brent, it's just like studying for a test in school. If you study for that test, you're going to ace it. You're going to be ready. You're going to nail it. So that's the way we always looked at it. An old band director of mine, when I was in high school, he said something that always stuck with me, too. He said, "Great, uh, good bands practice till they get it right. Great bands practice till they can't get it wrong. You're just on autopilot, and it's just, it's going to be killer. So then when we, when we did the uh, Ancient Curion thing, that was a little different because we did that in the middle of some different things. We didn't take all the time, like the 10 days to practice for just those, you know, because we played a lot of tunes, a lot of songs on that. But uh, yeah, I'm really, really happy with both of them for sure. The Ancient Curion, you know, it's an outside thing. There's a lot more like atmosphere there. That place was so cool where we did that, that old amphitheater. You know, that's an ancient place. They used to do gladiatorial events and stuff in there. And they didn't have like electricity or nothing. They had to bring generators and all that. We were the first thing like that to happen, like a modern show, or so they said. And it was killer. It was a lot of work. I mean, we showed up the night before, and they're just building a stage. And it's like, whoa. It seemed like a lot to do. And then the crew was there literally the day of the show in like 110-degree 100, weather for like 10 hours, I think, before we got there. Yeah. But that was great, man. Both of them were killer, and I'm so proud to be a part of both of them, you know, for sure. So, nice. uh, so I still have made history in Cyprus then. Yeah. Yeah, it was killer, man. Do you know, um, do you, I don't know whether you're, you're really the guy to ask this, uh, maybe it's John to ask, but do you, do you know what goes into the discussion when it's choosing where you want to film or record a live album like that? Is there usually a discussion like where you want to, what audience you want to uh, capture? Sure. Um, I mean, I have limited knowledge of it, um, but, you know, obviously it's based probably first and foremost off of the fans. You know, it's based on what kind of reaction that they, you know, that they give us. And uh, you know, to do it in Athens, that was like a no-brainer. I'll never forget the first time going to Greece. Just it was, oh man, we don't have enough time <laughs> to talk about that. Actually, one of my special things that I have to show, I'll I'll get back to that. I have a shirt that fans gave me from there. But anyhow, um, that's one of the things for sure. The fan reaction. Um, I guess the other thing would be obviously the venue. You know, if it's going to be able to be properly presented, you know, with proper production and stuff like that. Um, those are two major considerations. Those are the ones maybe I know a little bit about. And then, you know, of course, there's the fees and the contracts and, the you know, the uh, uh, legal side of it, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Now, um, I'm just going to move on forward a little bit in time. Um, uh, if I've got this correct, because I, I don't claim to be the... The, an expert on the band or anything like that. I'm just a fan, but um, you you wouldn't uh, record a full album with the band until framing. Am I correct? 
you are correct. Yay. I'm doing, I'm doing all right for guesses here. I'm doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> so how how, how, yeah. how was that, um, going into the studio for the first time and recording the full, full record? That, that was pretty... I don't know if I can cuss on this or not. Absolutely. Like, that was pretty fucking amazing, actually, man. It really was. Um, that, uh, uh, I mean, I could go on and on about it, but to give you a brief, a brief answer, um, when we did that... You know, uh, I uh, I actually recorded all, all the drums for Framing Armageddon and Crucible of Man in one shot. We did, oh, wow. did all the drums. Yeah. And it was the first time that I had recorded with just me and John, or me, John, and Jim Morris, the producer. It was just us. We recorded up at, uh, I forget what he called his studio in Nashville, Indiana. Is that a dungeon? Uh, no, it was something no. Eagle. Anyway, it was his home studio uh, in Indiana. We went up in the winter, and uh, you know, of course, I had worked up the songs. I think it was a total of 27, 27 tunes. And uh, I had gotten the demos. And I, would, I would get like a demo, and then I would get like a revised version, and maybe sometimes a third version. And then sometimes when you go to record, actually – Sometimes it will change, actually. Like, right when you're recording, they may change something. But but anyway, uh, it was probably around, I uh, forget how many days. I want to say maybe a week to a week and a half that we tracked the drums. We would do a few songs a day, and then Jim would do any kind of editing or anything that he needed to do to keep on pace with the recording. But it was really cool to be just me, John, and Jim to do that in a home studio i mean it was an awesome setting it was like a log cabin a pretty nice one but the acoustics in it were killer because of the way it was constructed it was just naturally acoustic great and uh you know to not have the pressures of being in a in a studio where you're paying by the hour you know i mean we're paying for the producer obviously but uh it was a little bit lower pressure you know but uh, you know, well, that's a pretty mammoth task, 20, 27 songs. But we started off by redoing the trilogy, you know, the uh, uh, original trilogy from uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes. We started with those tunes, and that was pretty cool. I was really glad to get to do those. The ones that came out on, uh, I think it was Overture of the Wicked. Yeah. But yeah, it was great, man. And uh, then Framing came out with Tim shortly after that. <clears throat> but by the time Crucible came out, when you hear it with Matt, like a lot of the songs on Crucible, I didn't remember as much because I had only heard them when we recorded. So then to be able to go back and then hear the finished product, I remember the first time hearing the whole record. We sat and listened to the whole thing with Larry and John's studio. That was neat to hear it in the end and you know, the fruition of it. But yeah, that was pretty neat. That was when I came back and got two for one on that one. Nice. That's Can you tell me what you were thinking uh, mentally going uh, from Matt to Tim to back to Matt? You know, can you kind of tell me what you were kind of yeah. your mindset was at that time? Sure. Well, I mean, playing with Matt in the early days, you know, that was awesome. I mean, Matt is truly one of the nicest guys that you will ever meet i mean amazing singer just a, a killer guy man and uh you know from doing all the old shows i didn't know tim at all when i came in for framing armageddon but you know of course i knew who he was and uh i think when we first went to rehearse before the first shows with uh you know for framing um the band started jamming like a day before and then tim showed up like the next day and he showed up like midday. He showed up and he walked in and he's like, man, sounds like a band up here. You boys sound pretty good. <laughs> he came in and I think we started with Burning Times and the first high note that he hit, you know, him and John just sort of gave each other a look. And I was like, ah, this is going to be pretty cool, man. You know, I mean, it's obviously it was very sad for Matt to no longer be there. But, you know, it's like, hey, this fucking guy, Tim, is pretty fucking good. <laughs> You know, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I got to do that. We only did 34 shows uh, for that. I think it was 34. 
but I'm really glad to have been able to, you know, obviously play with him and to be on a record with him. So then uh, going back to Matt, I mean, you know, a lot of people don't get a second coming like that. You know, myself, I've been fortunate to be able to return, you know, quite a few times. But for a singer to be able to come back, that was really neat, you know, to be able to do that. Um, it made the touring a little tricky, though. We weren't able to tour like we would normally. It was definitely more split up, <clears throat> you know, because of his obligations. Elsewhere. So it was great to do that. And, of course, it was very sad when he left again. But uh, the last show that we did with him in Bakken, I think it was 2010. That's the biggest crowd that we've ever played in front of. I think it was 80,000. And it was during the day. So you got a fuller scope of how many people that was. You know, and I mean, you know, if you're going to go out, if you know, if you have to leave, you know, like Matt did, that's a hell of a way to leave. You know what I mean? Show like that. Um, I have a uh, bootleg of that last show solely because. You do? Yeah, solely yeah. because like it's the end of an era in my eyes. You know, yeah. Matt is my favorite singer of all time. I think he, as a singer, he's a master at what he does. There's no one else like him. There's, I've, I've heard nobody else that sounds like him. He's, he's his own unique. He has a very unique vocal that I love. Right. And Yeah, and I saw, it, basically, I bought it. I, I shouldn't promote bootlegs on here, but anyway. Um, but it's it's, one, it's it's a bootleg I don't regret buying because it was it was pro shot, yes, but it was never officially released. I don't understand why Century didn't do that. I thought it was ample for an official release. But they didn't do it, so I just snagged the bootleg because I want to have that uh, in my collection as like a piece of history because it is, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. I wouldn't mind seeing that, man. I was going to ask how the quality was on it. It's, 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 it's on YouTube. It's pretty good. Um, it's decent. I can, I can grab it if you want to see it. Sure. Yeah, I'll send you a link to that. Uh... Through Messenger, Brent. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. Okay. Yeah, I've seen. There's one one uh, clip that comes up a lot. It's like three songs. Yeah, that that's, that's like that a better quality. Oh, is I it? I love okay. how Freddie. Okay. okay. I think so... Freddie comes out the end with a Matt fucking Barlow shirt on. Yeah, he's got <laughs> yeah. it on right there. So it's pretty. Yeah. It's pretty well presented for a bootleg. Uh, okay. Yeah. Not too yeah. bad. Yeah. The set list is pretty now, damn good as well. I love the set list. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Now, you've been a part of many tours, Brent. Are, are there any songs that you kind of nudge John at and say, hey, we should do this song? Or are there any songs that you would just love to play live? Um, There is one, I would say more than any, but I don't know if we'll ever do it live. Iron Will. Oh, off of, nice. Uh, yes, Stopia. please. Stopia. That is yes. one of my favorite songs, man. I mean, that's one of my favorite songs, period, not just Ice Earth. I love that song. I don't know why it wasn't on the regular version of the record. That's and, what we, uh, we were saying in the retrospect. Yeah. Like, Saw it Green. I love Saw it Green as well. That's, yeah. that's a tune. Yeah, that's a good one. I remember I did ask John about it. I mean, I've asked him about it several times. Uh, but um, the first time I asked him, you know, we were sitting around probably having a couple drinks, just whatever. And I was like, man, dude, we should do Iron Will sometime. He's like, ah, oh, yeah, man, that would be cool. And then he was like, nah, you know, it's probably never going to happen, Brent. I was like, oh, dude. You know, he's like, I mean, you got so many songs and whatnot. You got so many songs we got to play. But I was like, man, that's such a killer song. And then there was one time, uh, I hadn't mentioned it probably in a while, and it's on, it's my ringtone on my phone. And my phone rang, and he was like, oh, cool, I had such a cool song. I was like, I, we should play it sometime. <laughs> but anyway, I would say that one, that one more than any other, you know, for sure. Nice. I mean, we've done, we've done just about all the ones I'd really like to do, but I'm sure I could dig around, find some more. But Iron Will, for sure. I have one song and one song only. And could you, could you, that, could you nag John, please? <laughs> that. It would be Mystical End. From Storm Rider. Mystical end. I love that song. Mm. I need to I'll hear see it. See what I can do. No promises on that one, man. <laughs> we were gonna play that once. 
We were going to play that, I think, when I first, my first shows with the band. We had uh, talked about doing that, but we ended up not doing it. So, such But that would have been before song. your time, I think. That would have been 96, man. So. Yeah, I, I discovered the band in 2000, so. Uh, band was okay. already like 10 years old at that point. So you stepped down after the Dystopia tour. What did you think when uh, Plagues of Babylon came out? What were your thoughts of that album after hearing it and you not being in the band? Um, let's see. Well, I thought the, the production on it is really good. There's definitely some cool songs on it, for sure. I like some of the maybe the more obscure ones on it. Um, ah, man, I can't remember the name of the one. It's about a gunslinger. Peacemaker. Yeah. Yeah, that one. I really like that one. I mean, I like a, yeah, a few of them for sure a lot. C Cthulhu is probably my favorite off the record. I thought that one was killer. And then, of course, the title track. I thought that Raphael did a really good job. You know, I thought the guy that, that recorded on the record, I thought he did a great job. We've uh, uh, we've we've reached out to him, so hopefully yeah? we can get him on. Yeah, like I said to him, like, you know, I thought the drums were phenomenal on that on that album. I thought he did a great job. Some really uh, tasty double bass, some nice fills and stuff and whatnot. He was very snappy, very snappy player. You know, of course, at the time especially, I wasn't as into it because I wasn't a, a part of it. But I was glad to see the band do a proper campaign for it. You know, they did a, a bona fide, you know, world tour for it. So while I was sad to not be a part of it, I was very happy for them to do that, you know, to spread it to... New territories, new countries. You know what I mean. Um, nice. As as a drummer myself, I can't help but gush. I can't help but gush. The snare sound they captured on that album is just explodes. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, I really would love to know what what went into capturing that sound. I know you can't help because you didn't play on it, but like it's like yeah. an awesome snare sound. Mm -hmm. Love it. Yeah, yeah, it is very explosive. That's a good word for it. I'm sure it's a combination of the actual drum, the the attack, you know, the way, way the guys playing it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mixed with mixed with EQ, and then a lot of times on the snare and the bass drums, there'll be a sample added. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know what a sample yeah. is? Yeah. yeah there's a lot of sample to it to some degree. It may be only maybe thirty percent sample, seventy percent natural, but something to give it a little bit of extra pop. Yeah, it's got. But yeah. It's got, it's got a lot of bottom ends. That's what I like about it. It's a lot of bottom ends. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's got high attack. Like Chuck's, sure. looking, at, Chuck's looking at us like he says, another fuck we're talking about. Because <laughs> it's like drum, <laughs> drum talk. But yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm very much a big fan of the drum, the drum sound on that album. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's great. Again, speaking of drums, as you're, you're, you're a drummer, um, listening to that record, would there be anything you would have changed in terms of groove-wise, in terms of the grooves oh, and yeah. stuff? Uh... Yeah, I'm sure that I definitely would have changed some things. I've never, I never really thought about that to be honest with you. But a lot of the uh, the grooves are pretty tied to the rhythm guitar, <clears throat> so a lot of that stuff's pretty fixed. But yeah, I definitely would have played it different, you know, to some degree. But eh, for the most part, it probably would have been a lot, lot like that, you know, just maybe the fills different, maybe certain accents, you know, certain things. Yeah, that's fair. So you so you come back and uh, when you laid the tracks, was pretty much the Incorruptible already wrote completely, or was it still in the um, process? Or? Uh, uh, no, it was uh when I first came back this last time, it was being written. It was uh. Uh, I would say it was a good while before the writing was finished. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really have anything to do with the writing. That's not what I'm saying, but it was, uh, it was being crafted for a while. You know, that one was actually it took a good bit longer than was expected. You know, for for numerous reasons. But uh, you know, I heard it as it was being developed. But, but uh, yeah, no, it was nowhere, no. Nowhere near done by any means when I came. Do you have a favorite track or two that you liked right away off of that or off of Incorruptible? 
Um, yeah, I mean, quite a few. The ones that stick out, uh, you mean of the finished product or like of the demos yeah. I was hearing? Yeah. Okay, of the finished Either. product. Uh, well, we'll just go with it with, off the album, you know, as it is now. Uh, I would say one, the one that really sticks out for me, believe it or not, is Ghost Dance. I didn't know that was going to be an instrumental until I heard the final version. And then after I did, I mean, that's that's a really cool song. Uh, that one, I really liked Brothers a lot. Um, think of what? Black Flag a lot. And then uh, Clear the Way, for sure. I mean, I really liked all of them, but I would say those, those stick out more. That's nice. cool. Um, when, it, when, it, when it comes to, when it, in regards of like um, laying down your, the drums, um, how much creative control do you have on that? Or does John, does John have a vision in mind of what he wants the drums to be? Or does he just, you know, oh, bring yeah. you in and go, go ham? <laughs> oh, yeah. John has a vision. Yes, that's, that's, that's <laughs> yes. He, he definitely, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely John's vision. Uh, you know, he's always open to suggestions and whatnot. You know, but yeah, like, uh, you know, when I get the songs on the demos and whatnot, the beat patterns are pretty fixed. The fills, uh, not so much. You know, I have a lot more leeway in the fills. And of course, you know, I can suggest different things. But yeah, it's definitely John's vision. I do have some input, but I don't want to give myself more, you know, too much credit for that. That's, uh, you know, John is the mastermind. <laughs> Coolio. Now, um, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jason. I was going to say, uh, you're going to be going back, coming back to Europe. Yep. For, yep. for mostly festival runs? Um, I haven't really looked at all the dates. It's supposed to be a lot of festivals with some headline shows in between. I think it's 27 shows in all. It'll probably be maybe 60, 40 as far as 60% festival shows, something like that. Like maybe more, but yeah, it should be majority festivals. Um, is, is that, is that going to end the, the tour for now, uh, for the incor incorruptible run? For now, uh, I don't know how much I'm really supposed to say. Okay. <laughs> but uh, there won't be, uh, there won't be any more touring for incorruptible this year. Okay. There probably will be a bit more in the new year. I'm not sure how much, though. Okay. But no, that won't be the end. But it, it's getting, there won't be a whole lot more after this, but there will be some. Cool. Okay. Cool, yeah. Uh, do, you have a, do you have a favorite Ice Earth album that you didn't play on? We always <laughs> like to ask people that. <laughs> favorite one I didn't play on? Um... I have, I kind of have a few differences. It's hard to pick one, just one favorite. Sometimes it's the first one that you really hear. Um, and for me, the first one that I really heard completely was Burnt Offerings. Um, of course, I really love Dark Saga. Um, it's really hard to pick just one. Uh, Those are two good ones. Yeah, but I mean, I really love Horror Show, too, and Glorious Burden. I mean, I, I really like all the records. Uh, it's really hard. That's a hard question to answer, man. I don't know if I can give you. I don't really have a clear favorite. I like different ones for different reasons, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I can really accurately answer that, man. I would hate to say one, and it's not really, like, the one. <laughs> Our list change all the time, so I understand that. Yeah, with, oh, I get it. you know, <laughs> with with a with a catalog of such a high caliber as I surf, it's it's very hard. Like you know, we are like, me and Chuck are gonna make we're gonna rank them in our, uh, like, our personal like ranking. Right. So, like, that's gonna be hard because you know we we've got you know we 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 we, we love them in certain ways each one, all twelve records. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be that's gonna be a hard list to make, Chuck. I'm not looking forward to that Absolutely. at all. I'm really not. <laughs> We have our favorites, though, so, you know. 
That's cool. So, so we're going to get to some viewer questions here in a couple of minutes. You got some stuff to show us first, though, correct, Brent? I sure do. I sure do. Let me see here. <clears throat> I got it back here. Let's see. What should we start with? Some of it you've seen already. So I haven't. I haven't. Okay. Well, it wasn't, some of it wasn't it recorded, from... though. What's that? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's see. What should we start with? Um... <laughs> Yeah, well, there's this. I know you've seen this before. Oh yeah. I think Chuck oh. said that, that Larry. Yeah. Showed yeah, him yeah, his. So that's the gold record from Alive in Athens. I'm not sure how clear it's coming into video there. I guess you can see. Oh, yeah, yeah. But you know the song. Uh, it actually went platinum in Greece. This yeah. is the gold record. Here. But I was told that Live in Athens went platinum. I'm not sure what that number is, because you know it's Greece. It's not like going yeah. platinum in the States. This is the ride symbol from Alive in Athens. That's the wow. One. It's a Pisces now. I'm endorsed by Sabian now, so Sabian all the way. But back in the day, Pisces actually gave me a full set of these symbols and they're all broken if you want, they're all if you, if you want to sell that if you want to sell that hook me up yeah you know what i mean uh, <laughs> no it's actually broken oh. but i still yeah, have you it. don't need that no more it's broken it. see um yeah how, how do you pronounce the name peisty peisty i've always yeah. called it paste paste yeah <laughs> paste yeah i think I think technically it's Pisty, but... I Is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, know. they gave me a full set of, uh, uh, I want to say something like 16 symbols to do the recording, and then I was told I could keep them. Nice. So, nice. there's that. I wish I was giving free symbols. <laughs> symbols are so expensive. Oh, uh, there Lyman it is. I showed him the other day. This is a letter opener that was Whoa, given to fan club members around the Something Wicked era. So it's got Seth's head on it there, and then it's got the logo. Holy fuck. That's amazing. Of course, it's got the sharp point. Now, when this thing came out, I remember joking around about how, how somebody was going to end up in the gutter in Berlin or something with the nice dirt thing in their neck. <laughs> so it's, it's like a weapon. But anyhow, this it is does. one cool, cool thing. I don't know. There's not a whole lot of these. I don't think there was. But it's heavy. It's heavy duty. So I, I've never seen or heard of I, that before. I need to hunt for that now. I need one in my life. <laughs> I need one now. Yeah. yeah. I need one really bad. Other than that, I've got... Quite a few uh, <laughs> passes from the shows That's over cool. all the years. That's really cool. All my, all my badges. Now, out of those, I've got a few favorites. Here, let's see. It would be probably in this order. We've got the uh, Judas Priest. We uh, did some festivals with them, but we were also able to do I was four to six shows with just them. I mean, there was like maybe one or two other bands, but just on their tour, that was really cool. And then uh, these shows were utterly amazing. We did 11 shows supporting Heaven and Hell and Lamb of God in England. That was really neat. But I guess maybe the crown jewel would be that one. Wow. The only show that I've done with Iron Maiden, but we do actually have one this summer. So those are okay, some of my nice. favorites. Um got something else a little bit. This is something that some fans gave me in Greece. I always thought it was neat and I kept it. It was like from ninety uh, it's got the date on it. This is some exclusive stuff, Jason. Yes. From the Smedley Museum. Yeah. It's a shirt the fans gave me. Okay. I don't know how well you can see it, but it's yeah. burn offerings. It's got all their names on it, and they all signed it for me. What they did on the back, I don't know how well you can see that. They wrote all of the lyrics 
Dante's Inferno. That's cool. All of them <laughs> on the back of their shirt. And That's... they were just such huge fans. And they're like, oh, we want you to have this. I don't ever wear it. And it's uh, not in the best shape. But someone there also gave me this in Greece. I don't know how well you can see that. It is the Spawn dude oh, on cool. a necklace. Okay. Nice. I've, I've kept it. I put it up on my wall, and I often wondered. I don't remember the fellow's name, but if he's out there, I still got your necklace, man. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. That is fucking awesome. You know, one of my things. Much, what's that? One of my favorite. One of my favorite things about you being on tour is your walkabout pictures. I love seeing kind of the neat little, you know, odds and ends in each city that you go to. The fans really mm -hmm. enjoy that. Oh, cool. That's really neat. Thanks, man. Yeah, that's something I just started doing. Uh, you know, everybody sends the the normal pictures of, you know, here's the venue, you know, here's the stage, here's the show. And those are great. You know, those are great. But something I like to do uh, is walk around, you know, every day. It's, it's kind of therapy a bit. It gives me a little time away from everyone. And I like to explore. If it's somewhere I've never been, but sometimes even if I've been there, I like to go back and see if, you know, things are the same and whatnot. Sure. It's just sort of my way to share with people, too. These are, you know, some of the things I'm seeing. So yeah, it's just sort of a fun thing I do. And I'm, I'm glad you get a kick out of it, man. I do. <laughs> on, the, uh, on the Dystopia tour, uh, yeah, before the show, me and my friend was uh, walking about. We bumped into John and, their and the tour manager. And a chat with John. Mm -hmm. Then you literally, we got to near the venue. Uh, this is in Islington in London, and you walked past, and we were going to say hello, but you were taking photos, right? So we kind of left you alone. But my brain was like, mm -hmm. "Why is he taking photographs of Islington? What a shithole!" <laughs> 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 Seriously, oh, like, it's the yeah, yeah. Islington's not right. like not the nicest place to take photos, but whatever's good for you, man, yeah. it's all good. <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's just something different, you know, something yeah, different, yeah. looking different for me or something. But yeah, no, you should have said, hey, man. <laughs> do you remember, um, I don't know if you remember, I, I always try to say, do you remember? Because it's a typical fan bullshit. But uh, do you remember um, you played London in 2012? You played mm -hmm. uh, a venue called The Underworld. Uh, yes, I do. It was near Christmas and I was like the only fan outside at like six hours before the show. And you You're the one out. wearing the flag. <laughs> Yes. Were you wearing a flag? That's you. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Of course I do, man. It's not the only one there. Like I, I get to our <laughs> shows super, super early. Because mm -hmm. I like to be at the front. So, yeah. yeah. Sure. So that yeah, no, fun. I remember that. I remember seeing you. I remember the venue because it was sort of, it was kind of tiny. And yeah. it was like dark. It's like my favorite And it was literally, I guess, London. underground. What's that? It's like my favorite venue in London. I love that venue. Yeah. Cause it's so intimate. That's what I loved about it. Yeah, yeah, that was a cool show. It was killer. Yeah. So cool. are we gonna go on to viewer comments, Chuck? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I have while you're loading now. I just have one last question. Uh, when you brought out the Alive in Athens, it made me think of me and Jason have talked about this. Do you know what the top selling Iced Earth album is? Because uh, I've not seen it anywhere. I've looked and I haven't found any information about that. No. I I do not. I do not. That could be, maybe, but I'm not sure. Uh, I know Glorious Burden did very, very well. So I'm I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I really don't know. It's it's funny because like I, I, I heard from somebody somewhere that it was Glorious Burden. And it could it, have been, could be. Go ahead. I was gonna say, if it was Glorious Burden, then you know, too right that album deserves it because album is fantastic. Um, but yeah. I, 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 we even heard from John when he was on the on the show. Um, Burnt Offerings is probably it sounds like from what he told us, Burnt Offerings was a flop and it was probably the lowest selling album by the sounds of things. Yeah, uh, which sucks. I think so. Yeah, the album was great. Well, they didn't they didn't tour behind it. You know, they did five shows. Wow. It did. It was it was wasn't promoted and they decided to just go on and make the next record. So 
I've always yeah, wondered, like, know. is that is that is that an error on the label side of things for that not being promoted properly? Uh, it's sort of a long story. Uh, it was a it was a good bit of time between Night of the Storm Rider and Burnt Offerings. It was a few years, and there was some feuding between the band and the label. Yeah, and uh, there were some other issues as well. But uh, I'm really not sure, you know, because I wasn't involved then. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I think the general consensus was just let's go ahead and move on, make the next record, and then we'll tour. So they just decided to move on rather than to, you know, do the proper campaign for it. That's fair enough. Um, now, the, I did want to say one thing, though, about The Glorious Burden. That is definitely a great record, but I think. If that is the highest selling record, it's a combination of factors of the band building to that point. And then that was on a different record label. Yeah. And that yeah. was actually one that got proper distribution. I remember being told that it was in like Walmart and stuff, and it was like on the end cap. It was properly promoted and whatnot. And the label. Do you think that, that it was. What's that? You think Tim's name helped it also? You know, him coming uh, from I'm Priest? Sure, I'm sure that that didn't hurt. I'm right. sure. So, yeah. But, I mean, it's a great record. You know, just on that. Yeah, absolutely. Merit. You know, it's, it's an awesome record. So. I, I would argue it's the best produced record out of the catalog. Like, I've got the vinyl, and the vinyl sounds fucking immense. Yeah. It sounds I think that so was the, good. Yeah. I think that may have been the first one that was digital. I'm not sure, but I, I think. I think I think John said it was, yeah. I think. Yeah. Because I think John said it was like horror show was kind of half and half, and then yeah, yeah, glorious was the first like full on digital tracking. Yeah. Uh, viewer questions, people. Yeah. Right. Um, it. There's a lot of repeat questions we've already asked though. Um, I'm just gonna. I'm, uh, I can't pronounce this guy. Why do you have people that I can't pronounce their names? Uh, I I really I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pronounce his surname Her, Her, Herrera. I think I say pronounce his name. Her name. I don't know if it's even a girl or what. <laughs> I'm terrible. Her, uh, Herrera. Herrera oh. asks, "What are your thoughts on the drummer from Miss Sugar?" Ah, I saw that one in the comments. I think that he's amazing, man. I think a lot of stuff that he does is uh. It's unique. It's definitely not straightforward. It's very, uh, you know, odd times off beat. One of my friends put it uh, really well about Meshuggah. They, they almost sound like they're playing backwards or like they're sort of playing in waves the way the music comes. I think he's great. Hey, is that that's Thomas Thomas Heike or he I don't know his name. I think, <laughs> I, think that, I think that's who he is. Th Thomas Heike or something, the guy from Meshuggah. Yeah, I think he's killer. Cool. He's completely out of my 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 range completely. <laughs> yeah, he's uh his his footwork is ridiculous. <laughs> he's got some skills. Yeah. Um there's a lot of repeating questions. Uh our our, our friend Adam Ortiz asks, Do you remember him from the Encrypted Tour? He wore a iced earth sombrero to the show in yes. Houston in Houston. Of course, I remember that guy. <laughs> <laughs> the guy in his hat. Yeah. yeah. There you go, Adam. You've been remembered, sir. Oh, yeah. How could I forget that? <laughs> um, Andrew Edwards asks, if Ice Surf didn't exist, that would be a terrible world to live in. Uh, if Ice Surf didn't exist, uh, what would be the one band you would want to play in? Um, well... I guess I'd probably have to say Iron Maiden. Good answer. Good answer. Iron Maiden. That's a great answer. I, I think they got their guy. Nobody's going to take Nico's spot. No. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely Maiden. That's a good answer. Yeah. Um, uh, I think you've pr more or less covered the reasons behind this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Ty Hayes asks... Uh, why did it take take so long for you to finally get into the studio and actually record an actual record with the band? I think you basically covered that more or less. Yeah, it was the timing of the releases and then, you know, my personal issues in the 90s. 
but uh, it was great, you know, like I said, to be able to come back and finally do that with the Framing Armageddon and Crucible of Man. And for me, they were one. <laughs> yeah, to do both of those yeah. like that at once. So that, that was great, but... That's cool. Uh, Tyler, Ty, it's not Tyler, I can't fucking read. Tyler Duncan asks, uh, what what are the best and worst parts of working with John Schaefer? <laughs> <laughs> now we're creating waves uh, now. <laughs> well, I would say the best parts are, is that, you know, he's a true brother that loves all of his band members and uh you know the extended family of people that we work with and he's got your back you know what i'm saying he'll take a bullet for you and uh you know it's uh it's based on love you know respect uh loyalty um and he's uh you know he's very driven he's i would say he's the most driven guy that i've ever met you know, he has a vision and he will not be denied. He will not take no, uh, failure is, is not an option. You know what I'm saying? That's, uh, the worst parts are really not, I wouldn't actually call them worst parts, but I mean, he's, uh, he can be a hard taskmaster, but you know, that's what you demand when you want your brand to have a level of quality. You know, he doesn't ask anything that he doesn't give him himself. You know, and he gives a lot more than probably the rest of us put together. Um, so, you know, there's a. Uh, how do I say it? Um, you know, he maintains order. You know what I'm saying? The boss does what the boss has to do, you know, yeah. and you know what's expected from you. And you know what I mean? But uh, yeah. um, well, there's not really that not really bad that, parts. I wouldn't say, but go ahead. That reflects in the finished product. I mean, you guys are just on a roll. It's a it's a great time to be an Ice Earth fan, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh, thanks. It does it does really baffle me as well. Um, that's another reason. This, I'm, I'm going to go on a little tangent quickly, but um, obviously one of the reasons why we started this podcast is because you know for a band that's been going 30 years and as as hard as John has worked to keep this band going and. You know, putting out uh, the you know records of such high quality that he has been doing, it still baffles me that the band isn't on a higher tier than it, that, that it should well deserve to be. Like you know, I look at bands like Iron Maiden and Metallica and Judas Priest, and I automatically mm. slot Ice Earth in that tier because they just the band deserves to be in that tier because John and every member that's been from the past to the present has worked their asses off to get to to you know, put out these records that are just some of the best records ever made in my opinion so like it does well thanks my man i mean i agree i agree for sure uh you know we're still working towards that you know what i mean we're still uh working to build it and have it grow and uh you know i'm not really sure why exactly you know i mean there's been <clears throat> there's been struggle from the beginning in different areas with, you know, record companies, with management, with, you know, whatever the case may be. But uh, I'm glad you feel that way. And I feel the same way too, man. You know, and uh, you never know. I mean, I think that a lot of the songs off the new record, much less a lot of the records, there could be the one. You know what I mean? Could be the breakthrough. It could be Raven Wing. You know what I mean? That could be the breakthrough one. To get something on FM radio, or, you know, I don't know how important that is anymore, but, you know. Yeah, man. Like, the band should be bigger than they are, like, for sure. Well, thanks, man. I don't know if I'm going to grow anymore, though, man. <laughs> I'm, uh, I believe, I believe I'm shorter than you, so it's fine. Really? Yeah, I'm like five five or something like that. Well, like, ah, uh, yeah, I'm quite I might sure. have an inch or two. I think I'm about. I say I'm five seven anyway. <laughs> yeah, you want people to believe that, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, last question from the viewers. Um, uh, Andrew Edwards again. He asks, uh, "What part of the world that Iceurf has not visited yet would you like to take Iceurf to?" Um, 
I'd like to go to Egypt. Oh, nice. I would love to go nice. to Egypt. I don't know what kind of, I guess there's not much of a metal scene there. We would have already been there. But I would just like to see the pyramids and stuff. Really, I'd like to go anywhere that we haven't been. But Egypt definitely comes to mind. Can't really, uh, yeah. I would say nice. Egypt. Egypt's, uh, I always find Egypt quite fitting due to like the, you know, the, the story of Set and stuff, where it's like mm-hmm. sort of similar sure. kind of Egyptian origins, but not really, but sort of inspired by. Oh them. yeah, sure, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, there and maybe places like, uh, you know, Malaysia, Singapore, like that area. I know Dream Theater tours in that area a lot. I'm not sure what what that area is called, but you know where I mean. Yeah, yeah. Singapore, Malaysia, maybe the Far East. I don't know what you would call that exactly. But have you um, just out of curiosity, has, has the band ever toured Japan before? No. Ah, uh, how could I forget about Japan? No. No, I mean, I would love to go to Japan. Um, the band was slated to go to Japan, actually. I think around 2004 or something and Richard Christie left. They got Bobby Jazarmbeck. I think I'm saying that right. He came in on pretty short notice and they ended up canceling some Japanese shows to prepare for the shows right after that. Because of that, the band has never been able to get back to Japan in large part. I think because of that, the, uh, you know, the Orientals are, uh, a little like if you cancel something that you said you're going to do, I guess they're a little reluctant to work with you. I'm not sure. I would love to go to Japan though. You know, we've been to China and that was cool. Even though it was only two shows, it was great to go there, but Japan seems to be another stronghold, you know, it's like uh, North America, Europe, and Japan, the big territories. You know, not to slight any other parts of the world, but yeah. as far as the economies and whatnot, if you if you make it in those areas. Hmm. Just, uh, Can't forget about just, South America. Just because, um, <laughs> it's like, I'll just throw this out quickly. Uh, yeah, some 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 guys on the on the group and uh, on on our YouTube channel like uh, they they they're sick and tired of me whinging about you know not coming to the UK and stuff. Um, they they apparently there's a lot of Australian fans that would like the band to go to Australia that mm-hmm. you know, they've never seen the band so you know keep Australia in the in in in, in the back pocket. Oh yeah, well I mean I've been to Australia uh, and then the band went back on the Plagues tour. I think they did maybe even a few more shows. So, yeah, I mean, those show, the shows were killer. I actually have one of my favorite fan pictures ever that I took was in Australia my first time. I don't remember if it was Sydney or Melbourne, but there was a curtain, you know, in front of the stage, and it was closed. I went out and just stuck my camera through the curtain. So all they saw was, like, my hand and the camera, and I just snapped a couple shots. And I didn't look at them until later. One of those pictures is in the, I think, in the uh, Ancient Curion booklet. It's a classic shot. There's people throwing the horns. There's people raging. And there's one dude in the middle that just has this look on his face. But yeah, I think it was a sold-out show. Those shows were great. You know, I would love to go back there on this run. But I guess they're seeing what's out there for us. So, yeah, down under's killer. That's awesome. That's awesome. I can't wait for you guys to come to the UK, but I've I've I've, I've ragged on that note every, every every time we've had a guest on. I've ragged on that like, but I'm not going to today. I'm going to be good, so I'm going to be like you know. Um, I think we should wrap it up because I haven't got long left. Cause yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would love to come. I would love to come to the UK, man. I love it there, you know, and it's it's close for Luke. He can just join us over there. Right. Brent, I just want to close and saying, you know, I was so happy when I read on the internet that you got that you were coming back after uh, after plagues. 
and uh, welcome thanks, home. This is you are well loved, and uh, everybody was so happy to see you back. So well, thanks, man. It was great to be able to come home, man. I tell you what, I really appreciate that. From so. me, uh, from me, you're you're the greatest drummer alive in my in my opinion. Uh, you 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 made me be inspired to pick up the pair of drumsticks myself and, and, and learn to play myself. And yeah, um, I love playing there. It's like, I'm in my own band and just, that's all down to you, man. So I, I thank you so much for, uh, Hey man, thank you. Thanks a lot, man. That means that really means a lot, man. And when you are done with your project with your brother, we would love to have you back on and talk to you about it. Oh yeah, man, for sure. For sure, man. Most definitely, man. I got, uh, I got some, things in the works with that trying to get us a deal <laughs> seeing what's out there now record deals uh they're changing they change rapidly as far as what's really out there and what not you guys i'm sure know the state of the industry it's not as healthy as it could be but you know where there's a will there's a way so yeah i would right. love that i would right. love that okay i'm gonna take you guys home uh take us hey. home jason <laughs> ladies and gentlemen right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching this episode of Podcasting Stone where we spoke to Brent Deadly Smedley. Uh, it's been fun, man. I uh, appreciate your time, Brent. It's been fucking awesome. Uh, Chuck, as always, my friend, it's always great to do these podcasts with you, buddy. Uh, check in next time, guys, where we're going to be talking about the Plagues of Babylon album in our retrospect. That should be a fun one. Chuck, you're looking forward to that, right? Plagues of Babylon. I can't wait. One of my favorites. <laughs> Uh, and then after that, we'll have one more, which is the, which is uh, Incorruptible. We've gone through these albums ah. quite quick, man. We've gone through these albums quick. Started this in August. Started this in August, and it's only May, and we're like two records left. May there be ah, may there be many more records, man. Like I can't wait for what's, what, what's next on the table for the band. Oh, uh, yeah. Re-recordings and stuff. I'm looking forward to that. Not many people are, but I am. <laughs> Fuck everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think um, it could be really neat, man. I think it could be could be really neat, but I think the next studio album is going to be something spectacular, man. Hey, man, thanks so much, you guys. Thanks for all the fans. Uh, you know, you guys help keep this alive, and you're helping it get to the people, man. And that's that's such an awesome thing, man. You guys are your why metal lives, man. People like you and I, all of us really appreciate it from the bottom of our heart, man. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Anybody, everybody, we'll see you next time. Stay metal because, as Brent just said, metal lives, motherfuckers. See you later. <laughs>